Okay, so welcome everyone. We are in, in a very, very, very interesting day uh, of this new year, 5785, uh, otherwise known as Tuff Shin Notice the words Pei Hei, as in Pei. There's going to be a lot to talk about this year. There's going to be a lot of talking, and there is already a lot of talking. The question is what we're going to be talking about. So one day from the U.S. elections, one day uh, uh, with Iran weaponry poised at uh, to attack Rahman al uh, along with their proxies, Israel, in an unknown way, with an unknown result. So there's certainly an Indian to be, it's certainly people might be on a high level of anxiety. So we're coming to have a little therapy today to relax and understand the deeper meaning of things um, and tell the story that the Parsha tells, which is always the story of the day. So what I want to do is I want to um, explain some important points about the conflict of the nation of the world and particularly Iran, which is in the Parsha of last week and also extends to this week. There's a unique role that the lands of Babylonia and Persia play in the um, both ancient and modern game. Shockingly so. It's shocking how Iran, which was a nothing nation only 20, 30 years ago, um, radicalized and became the this, this central, how shall I say, protagonist of the entire free world. How is that possible? It's not explainable in a lot, in a natural sense. But to say that this is the divine plan, we have to understand what's going on a little bit, and it will help us process whatever happens tomorrow and thereafter. Okay, so let me start. There are two incidents that occurred in Lech Lecha and then back in Noah about a worldwide uh, campaign experience war. The two wars of no, the two world, I would, I would call one a world war and one a world conflict. The world war that appears in this week's parsha is the kings, the four kings against the five kings and the intervention of Avram Avinu and his aide, his primary uh, helper, who we will identify and the question is, what are they fighting about? And what's the whole point? And why does the Torah need to go through this? Wars in ancient times is nothing new. The Medrash alludes to the fact that the children of, of Shem were being booted out of Eretz Yisrael by the Canaanim. Okay, well, they don't go into any particular detail. Why do we need to know so much in so much detail about this war, what it represents, the strange interactions Avram has with the Four nations who he seemingly should support. They're more his his points of origin. The kings of stone and the killed king of Yushalayim, Shem, the son of Noah. This is a puzzle that needs to be put together so we can understand it and get a deeper message <clears throat> that is very, very, very relevant and pertinent. The other, the other world event, of course, was the story of the Tower of Bovel, which was last week's Parsha. And how we got there, which is <clears throat> the process by which the sons of Shem, uh, <clears throat> sons of uh, Shem, Ham, and Yopes proliferate, and then the events that take place in their time. So there's Dor HaFlaga. We passed the Dor HaMabel, that was last week. We're now in what's known as the Dor HaFlaga, the door of separation, which is relevant to Nimrod, uh, as we shall see. So this is the second 10 generations. The mission of us tells us, Asara Daros and Okay, we passed that. Those, the story of those 10 generations we told last week. This genealogy of Cain, the genealogy of, of Shes, and how those 10 generations terminated with Noah's emergence. And of course, the events of the model. But now we're in step two. Step two is the 10 generations between Noah and Avraham. And... We need to understand them, what their opportunities were, what their challenges were, what, are, what the message is for us. Today, specifically today, 
because we have an unusual reference uh, to those lands that where where the conflicts are currently taking place, specifically Iraq and the areas of Medea, which is also connected to Persia and Iran. They're in the news, and they're in the Parsha, which is identical, the same thing anyway. Okay, so let's look. Let's look at this um, by starting with a little background. Let's go back for a moment to the conditions that brought Avram into being and his mission of Lech Lecha, right? Uh, first, I'll just note that the command of Lech Lecha is dubious. First of all, we don't find that Hashem spoke to Avram at all until this point. And Mapitong, why would Hashem suddenly engage Avram? And not only that, but give him a curious command. Leave where you are, go to this land, which is currently dominated by some of the most nefarious people, the Canaanim. And we'll look at where their origins are. And what is he going to do there exactly? He's going to take possession of the land. It's not, it's not even possible to take possession of the land. Maybe it's not even ethical to take possession of the land, according to Avram, because the, for the moment, it belonged to the Canaanim. And as we see, Avram has to purchase a plot of land from the Chitim. We'll see who the Chitim are. But Hashem also tells him in such a way that you wouldn't think Avram would be careful, it would be concerned about. When, when Hashem gives the command of Lech Lecha, what does he say? Okay, I get that. Let's go to the Aretz HaSholacha. I have a mission for you. Fine. I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make you famous. And you will be a source of blessing. Do you think Avram, who is an Eved Hashem, who is a perfectly content to offer up his one and only future son, Takash Baruch with an act of complete bittal, cares that he's going to be the father of a huge nation. Why would he be concerned whether he's going to have a great name? God l'shmecha, ve'yei bracha, you're going to be a source of blessing. I mean, this is Avram Avinu. He wants to do Hashem's will. Back in his town of origin, Ur Kastim. Now the question is, is Ur Kastim a place, a, a geographical place, or is it a reference to an event? Not so simple. Avram was thrown into a fiery furnace, as we know, as the Medrash teaches us, quoted here in the Parsha by Rashi, Nimrod, and we'll see his history, this key figure we know nothing about, uh, decides to throw Avram into a fiery furnace, and of course he emerges miraculously, and where is that place? It, so, it's an event and a place. Ur Kastim, actually, the land of Ur, uh, could have been anywhere in the Euphrates River region. In other words, as high as Iraq goes and as low as Iraq goes. It's somewhere in Iraq. But the Iraq that Mufarshim pin it at is the Iraq that's very, very, very positioned exactly to the Iranian border, which is known as the uh, the Persian Gulf. Ur is the lowest, is the southernmost point of Iraq as it meets Iran at the Persian Gulf. So that's where Avram started out, it seems. Okay, we know he comes from Iraq one way or the other, but why all the way down there? So the Medrash says that he had fled there. In other words, the main action that was taking place in Iraq, as it is today, is in northern Iraq, closer to Syria, and uh, closer to the capitals of Babel uh, of the future. Um, Avram was a refugee. Avram was a refugee because he believed in Hashem. He had come to the philosophical, intellectual, and eventually prophetic understanding that Hashem existed, and he created the world. He would ask, Ma, Mi bana birazu, who, who built this? Who created the world? He asked typical questions, people that were not poised to think about, because they had their explanations that were given to them by their elders, which that the world was ruled by various gods, 
And not all the gods were so nice because uh, there was one god that you know threw a flood on them and destroyed the world, and they decided that they have to band together as human beings to protect themselves with their joint efforts against these nefarious and ill-tempered and ill-willed uh, idolatrous uh, images of God. Pretty sad. But Avram pierced through that darkness, and he understood that there was a divine plan here, and there was a mission for man, and that God created the world for a purpose, and he was all about finding that purpose. And he wasn't shy about talking about it. So his initial resistance to idolatry, as documented in the Medrash, he destroyed his father's, he destroyed his father's idols, um, caused him to be executed, which he survived miraculously from the fiery furnace. And at that point, something happened. Avram Avinu and his father, okay, all of a sudden got on the same page. They realized that the world as it had developed from the times of post-flood, in other words, the 10 generations preceding them, was an error. Not only were they were an error, but most of the world was off point. The Mishnah in Gerola says that the 10 generations from Adam and Noah, and Perkei, why were they enumerated? Why do we have their stories? Who cares about them? Because to see how God's infinite patience played out with these very lost and intrinsically troubled people. He says, even the second 10 generations of the world history were angering God. You see that they angered God. And Ad Sheba Avraham Vikibel Alav Sfar Kulam. Mishnah says, Avram suddenly comes along and says, these people are not going to be physically destroyed. There's not going to be any marble. They're going to be here. But I will assume the responsibility to make sure that they each receive their schar, meaning that they come around to the truth. So what we've set up with Avraham, according to the Pirkeiobos, is that he is the lone soldier of Hashem in a very, very confused world. Now, I want to build up the background for that. How did, how did they get there? So go, let's go back to Parshish Noah for a minute. We find uh, after leaving the flood, the, the narrative of the Torah picks up uh, in Perak Yud. Ela told us, B'nai Noah, this is how they developed. Now look carefully. B'nai Yefes. Yefes was older than Shem by two years. Shem was born two years after. Uh, Shem was 100, two years after the flood. And his progeny is listed first. And the names should be familiar to you. Pasuk Beis and Perakid. B'nai Yefes. Gomer. Magoig. Madai. Yavan. Tuval. Meshech. And Tiras, which Rashi identifies immediately as Persia. So the B'nai Yefes, which we associate with the Eurasian or the European, what would have ended up being the European Mediterranean populations. Okay, look, Yavan is Greece. Greece is the Greek islands near on, on the European uh, continent or close to it. Um, Tuval is also a reference to a land that's associated with Gog. Who is Gog? Where is Gog? It's quite a debate among their fortune. But most, uh, well, but if you look at one more pasuk, you'll get a hint. Bene Gomer, that firstborn son, Gomer, associated with Mago, Ashkenaz, the Verifat, Viturjama, we're talking about Germany. France and Germany. Guess what? Yafes, who the who we'll see later, Noah blessed, emerges as the father of the European continent and all of its nations, including Persia, Iran, which is considered part of the European continent. As we mentioned, Iran is really not Iran. Iran is Persia. What happened thousands of years? Everybody called them Persia. What happened now? 
is in World War II, as the Nazis promulgated their idea of a master race, it resonated with Persians who said, we are too a master race. They glommed on to the Nazi ideology and changed their name to Aryans, otherwise known as Iran. It's unbelievable. The only other uh, people, I mean, there were those who had, you know, treaties with, with, Nazis, with Nazis, but they didn't see themselves as Nazis, such as Japan and Italy. They didn't see themselves as that. But there was another nation that associated so deeply with it, uh, well, a nation, a movement, and that was the father of the quote-unquote Palestinian movement, Haj al-Husseini Yamachshim al-Zichro, the Amalekite, I will say, um, leader of the uh, of the Jerusalem is uh, Muslim community, Arab Muslim community, who associated and made personal visits and requests and designs to exterminate all the Jews of Palestine, quote unquote Palestine, mandatory Palestine. Now we know the word, the name Palestine was crafted by the Romans who destroyed our second base on Mikdash, didn't and had such a difficult time fighting the Jews with endless revolts in 66, and then again uh, by the Bar Kokhba revolts after the Horban bias, that the, the Romans made a massive, massive uh, emphasis to destroy the kingdom of Judea, which sadly they were able to do. Um, and they celebrated in Rome in such a fashion that we still have the remnants of it which is the Arch of Titus. And ironically, Titus, as the Roman emperor, becomes associated, Rome, with our main Gullus, which is associated with Edom, our brother Esav. So Esav, even though he was Semitic in origin, actually becomes part of, becomes exiled from the Jewish lineage and therefore goes to the next level, which is B'nai Yefes, and he becomes associated with with um, Persia, Germany, Greece, and ultimately, uh, when, when Esav, is, when Esav uh, reproduces, Rashi says one of the alufim of Esav, Magdiel, is Rome. So we know that this is the European uh, strain, not all bad. Um, Hashem did, Noach did bless them. But what was the blessing? Noach blessed them. Two perushim. Yaft means either expanded, that Hashem says, go expand, go take over the world. And the truth is, the, truth, the Europeans did expand and take over the world. They were the explorers. They're the ones that sent Christopher Columbus to look for the new world, the Portuguese sailors. And they found South America and... And all of the great seafarers, maybe all the way back to the Amalekite-rooted Vikings, <laughs> they all were exp expanded the world. They were the expansionists of the world. They're the colonizers of the world. They're the ones that are trying to rile uh, African Americans against colonization. They were they were the ones that took the slaves. But it says in the Torah that that's what's supposed to be, because the the children of their third brother, Ham, who was cursed. Ham, where were his people at? They certainly weren't in Europe. Here we go. B'nai Ham, Kush, that's Ethiopia, that's on the African continent. Mitzrayim, on the African continent. Put, Uknan. Now, Put, we don't know where it is, but we certainly know about Canaan, the Canaanites. Look what happened here. This is again back in Bracious Yud. Uh, uh, Kush, gives birth to Nimrod, the firstborn of Ham, right, is Cush. The fourthborn is Canaan, who was cursed by, by uh, Noah because he prevented Noah from having a fourth son, which is, again, a whole explanation is required as to what Noah's intention was. He wanted to, why did he want a fourth son? Rashi says, because he's, he wanted people to serve him, to be enslaved to him, so to speak. So the destiny of the fourth son, right, which ends up here being tagged or flagged 
as the fourth son of Cush, have assumed the role of servitude. You know, that's unfortunate. It's also focused on the on the African continent. Sabata Rama, Sabtra, Bene Rama, Shva, Malka Shva. Shva is also an area, Somalia, somewhere there, Dodon. And but what does also what, what does Kush also yield to us? He yields to us Nimrod. What does Nimrod mean? Let's rebel against Hashem. Like a slave would rebel against his master. It's not our fault that Noah articulated Alpi Nivua, that this strain of his progeny, the Chamites, the Kushim, and I have nothing against African Americans. And by now, certainly, the world has been mitgalgel and evolved, and we're, here, we're heading towards Mashiach, and goodness knows this is not an ethnic or racist idea. Just that there's a concept a concept of slavery, which is associated with there, which, thank God, in the Messianic era that we're in, the year of Mashiach, has been abolished. America was a big part of that. Okay. So Yefes relinquishes his servitude, and also the B'nai Ham, which are Mitzrayim, the Arab nations. Egypt is primarily the real Arab nations. The B'nai Yishmael also rejected the yoke of their eldest brother Shem, which is represented by, of course, the um, our Jewish neighbors, uh, our the neighbors of the Jews, which is the um, Ishmaelite Islamites till today, and by name. So, what did this Nimrod do? Nimrod goes far away from his native lands in Africa. He was the master manipulator and speaker of falsehoods to lead the rebellion against Hashem. Now, I understand why he wants to rebel against Noah and Hashem's prophecies, because he's cast in a, um, in a, serv in a servile life. He is here to serve. But he did decided not to serve. He decided to dominate and rule. So he's a keyboard side. He traps people with his eloquent seductions, much like the Nachash. And by the way, we do know, as we said in the previous year, the Nachash is the genealogical father of Cain, whose lone surviving child was Nama, the wife of Noah. And it seems that Ham carried more of the of the ge the genetics of that family stream. The 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 Canaan the um. Cain, even the, the you know, uh, Lakayan, Cain, Tupel Cain, all that strain, which were Nachash, biologically uh, dominant people, and the strain of Shes, which Adam produces after the events of the Garden of Eden, and has a whole new lineage. And as we said last week, there were two Lamachs, one from the, the Cain um, descendancy from the Nachash, as the, as the Zohar says, that the Nachash and Adam both had relations with Chaba and came out these two sons. Uh, the Nachash's son, Cain, Adam's son, Hevel, which was destroyed, eventual Gilgal Moshe Rabbeinu. And then we started again. So the the the, uh, the Seth the Seth community, uh, uh, um, Adam Rishon's third son, also produces a Lama, who's the father of Noah. And then a Shidduch took place, that the two Lamas got together, one one uh, was the father of Noah. One was the father of Nama, who was to be the wife of Noah. They get together, and of course, the children are produced. Shem, Ham, and Yafes. However, it seems Shem being the first, the more being mitpate, more articulating the highest element, higher element of man. Yafes middle, and Ham unfortunately the worst. Better tells us that Ham did two very troubling things. Number one, he had relations in the in the Ark, even though everybody was trying to purify the idea of the bris, which is, of course, why bris comes to Noah after the flood, and it's associated with bris milah, chastity, the animals had to separate, the children of Noah had to separate, they had to clean up their um, perversion. And, and uh, the sign of that, ironically, is the rainbow, the keshet, 
Well, who else uses the rainbow as a sign today? Who is the flag of the rainbow? Not What's the rainbow coalition? What? LGBTQ. Yeah. LBGBTQRXY and Z. Why did they take the why did they take the rainbow? The rainbow is the sign quite the opposite. It's os bris. It's coming very close to the holy bris of Avram that mankind would experience in the next next set of generations, the progeny of Avram. Meet the progeny of Avram all went through a, a, a full bris mila. The the uh, Noah was born without a bris, without an orla. So we see Noah was already approaching this idea of personal chastity and purity, and he lived it. And that was what the table was all about. It was a boxed out holy place, and and um, Bicham punctured that that atmosphere of holiness and had relations because of his you know tendencies towards uh you know not being able to uh keep to those sort of higher levels of behavior three people had relations in the ark both are problematic so all are all are problematic the raven the caliph and ham and the raven we find of course inexplicably it seems is the chosen one to be sent out by noah perhaps because he wanted to get rid of him because he was a bad influence. And of course the raven says, I'm not leaving. He doesn't even go on a mission to leave. Aishalach, Mufarshim say over there, he didn't want him to come back with news. He just wanted to get rid of him as soon as he could. The tops of the mountains are, are visible. Bye, raven, I, you're out of here. Maybe your wife is is more innocent, and but you know maybe she has some eggs, maybe there's hope for your species, but you, you are out. And um, and then of course, Noah tries the Yonah, of which he took seven birds. I guess he could spare one, and this represented the Yonah is of course a an expression of the Jewish people, right? Uh, Yonasi Tamasi. They're very very loyal to their mates. In fact, there's two things: there's Tor and Ben Yonah. A Tor is a turtle dove, and a Ben Yonah is what we call, a, I guess, a pigeon. Um, one thing about them is that they're they're not want to remarry so easily. Now, a Yona will eventually remarry, and that's why a Tor is a more choice carbon because it's completely loyal to its Ben Zug and never remarries if his partner is uh, is is taken or murdered. Right. So, what was Noah doing now? He said, "Okay." We got to get rid of this guy who is following, you know, mom's, you know, you know, Zaidi, Zaidi, the Nakash is Derek. Let's get him out of here. We've been purified. Let's stay purified. And of course, because I'll say later that the, the Doros after Noah will go to Atzman Arayos until Bilam comes. And again, Bilam is an example of prime evil, prime evil. And the prime evil then undoes even what Noah was able to accomplish. But and then of course Ham is in that category as well. So that's really problematic. And he produces Kush, who produces Nimrod. So Nimrod is acting against the Bris. Okay. Now, what does he do? He goes to the purified lands of Shem and starts up. Kush Yolanas Nimrod, Vu Helios Gibor Baris. He starts taking the charge. Huhaya Gibor Tzayed, he was able to, to seduce people with his words to rebel against Hashem, as Hazal tell us. Gibor Tzayed, Lifnei Hashem, he understood Hashem, he, he heard from he heard from his aunts and uncle, you know, he heard from his Zaidi, but he says, I'm going to anyway rebel against Hashem, because I don't like what I've been relegated to. Vatihi Reishis Mamlachto Bavel, one minute, what's he doing in Bavel? He's from Africa. You know, one of the things, if you go to fancy, I did, I took courses in, um, you know, uh, understanding biblical language. So they speak about Akkadian. Akkadian is a language very, very similar to the language of Hebrew and Aramaic. And Vikalna Be'eretz Shinar. Where is Shinar? Where is Shinar? Shinar is Iraq. What's he doing in Babylonia? And also... 
the other part of Iraq, Eretz Shinar, which is already approaching Persia. So what happens next? Ashur Ashur was one of the pure, purer sons of Shem. He's the father of Syria, Ashur. And Ashur is a Semite. He's not an Arab. Ashur, unfortunately, becomes the tormentor and destruct and destroys the ten nations. And it's more associated, unfortunately, with cousin Lavan and his doings, um, who also caused terrible problems throughout the ages, including Bilam being being a personification of Bilam and later generations. So we had a problem. Nimrod goes and attacks this area that's supposed to be more aligned with Hashem. And and he takes over. So Ashur, who was still at that point untainted, leaves and builds Vayivain as Ninvev, as Rehobos Irvas Kalach. He splits away from the evil Nimrod and he says, this is not where we're going. I'm not having these Hamites dominate the Shem land, Shem area, which goes all the way down to Eretz Yisrael, right? And stops there before you get to Egypt. Remember, Kalah Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael goes all the way up till Egypt, till Egypt, which is the land of Ham. He says, go back to the land of Ham. We're building our own city called Nineveh. And of course, that's why Chazal say Nineveh was prone to do tshuva very quickly because its origin was founded against on, on, on serving Hashem and departing from those who would rebel against Hashem. It, it was a town that was based on, on purity and tshuva, and therefore it, had, it was easily um, easily overturned to the good. Of course, some people say that Paro was the king of Nineveh, again, play, playing the same concept, that Nimrod goes to rule a place that he shouldn't belong. It's like a Nimrod conti uh, continuity from the children of Cush and Ham. Uh, but having been schooled by Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Paro by that point understood that Ninva ha is has to be overturned. Otherwise, we're in for another Mitzrayim. And out of fear of that, they repent. Okay. So what have we seen? Just to recap. The three sons of Noah give birth to three strains of nations. The Shemites, which are not European. I would call them Aramean. Not European. Uh, the the Yefes, which is more projects out towards what creates the Western world. Uh, the Eastern world remains under Shem, and then the African world, that other direction, is associated with Canaan, um, with Ham, and with Cush, and with Nimrod, and they come to make trouble. And so much so that Nimrod comes to kill Avram. Now, Avram is the only hope that Noah's beginning Tikkun, that Noah was Nolan Mahu, that Noah was, was the father of the Keshet, that Noah purified the world and set Gedorim to the world, you know, which is why it's interesting to think about what happened to Noah in his tent when he tried to produce a fourth son and he took the Kerem. What happened to Noah is an interesting question. And what was he trying to accomplish? I'm not going to go there right now. But Canaan interferes in that and actually eviscerates Noah's ability to have more children, saying, we've already have enough rivalry in the world. There was Cain and Hevel, remember? So we better not have more kind of Hevel problems. So let's just leave the world the way it is. Two sons more associated with Adam, one son associated with the Nachash, just like Cain and Hevel. Cain was the Nachash. Hevel was the, you know, maybe he was saying, maybe Kanan was saying, it's bad enough that you got me. You're going to have another kid, maybe more towards the towards the uh, Nama side of the genealogy. And then we're going to be, we're going to have two on two. It's going to be a problem. I hear that. But the idea being that the rivalry, the hatred, the taking what's not yours, the acceptance of evil, the willingness to work with evil and negotiate with evil and deny Hashem's plan for the world and try to create some sort of idyllic Gan Eden. Always, always the enemies of Hashem are trying to build Gan Eden. This is that they have their own ideas what Gan Eden is. All right. And so too did Nimrod. And that explains the whole Parsha of the Dor HaFlaga, 
that Hashem had to separate them because they all went to the Valley of Babylon and created a, a united nations. So ironically, Nimrod was the first who created the concept of united nations. And of course, the children of Yafes, Gog, Gog, according to the Malbim, others represents Gog, represents a roof, the wide tent, which encompasses all nations for their own unique vision of what the world should be in opposition to Hashem. Gee, does that sound familiar? And as I told you last week, the Israelis voted to, to get rid of UNRWA. It's a, not a small thing. It's a huge step. And of course, it will be battled. It will be, and it's not the complete step because they didn't kick them out of, of Gaza and and uh, and Shomron. So it's a partial victory. But again, we'll take whatever, which victories um, we can hope for. And standing up to the Shibud Malchus, which wants a world with a vision that is not Hashem's vision. Okay. So where does that leave Avraham and Elias? So what happens is, after the breaking up of the of the Dor Haflaga, the Tower of Bavel gets dispersed, Nimrod stays where he is in Iraq, close to Persia. He stays there. And probably the children of Tiras, Persia, are still are there. And he's still dominating that area. And he but he's not the all over boss as he was. A new boss emerges, and his name, according to Rashi, is, is is he was the leader is Chador Omer. He is the one that will lead the campaign against the nations of Canaan. Now let's understand this a little bit. Just hold cup. Nimrod, Nimrod came to Shinar, comes and establishes his Malchut. But who was the one who instigated the tower? Was it Nimrod? According to Rashi, it wasn't Nimrod. It was the children of Shem, Ham, the Yafes. As the Pasuk says, that they said to each other, ish, ish, um, here's the language. Uh, okay. okay. And it says, says Rashi, who's Isha Rie? Who, who came up with this, with this brilliant idea? Okay, who's whose idea with this? So Isha Reehu is Uma le Uma Mitzrayim le Kush, Kush le put, put le Kanan. What's interesting about put is put is from the origins of the Plishtim, which come from the strains of Ham. Plishtim come from Ham. So anybody who wants to identify as quote unquote a Plishti, a Palestinian, is really reflect reflecting not such a wholesome origin. Because Rashi tells us that they got mixed up with the other children of their, they used to share wives, Nebo. And therefore, all these cousins, all these kissing cousins, uh, created a, you know, Nebo, uh, a bastardized race. And Isharayahu, they were all kind of uh, one mishpacha, one big family. Notice that Rashi says that the instigators of building the Tower of Bavel were the children of Ham, that strain, Mitzrayim, Ham, Canaan, right? Says it Beferish. Cush is the firstborn of Ham. Cush, Laput, Put, Le Canaan, fourth son of Ham, and it's all one big Balagan. So even though the instigator of taking over the lands of Shem, by moving to uh, into into the Iraq and into that area, which is what Nimrod did, he didn't start the process of building that tremendous uh, tower of resistance against Hashem. What he did, what, what he did was, he said, "I'm going to be the ruler." He came there with some sort of program of unity, you know, call, <laughs> do some sort of socialist perspective. God is out of the equation, but the the instigators, the real troublemakers, were not necessarily Nimrod, but his associates, the other children of Ham. And why did they want to stay there? And why were they afraid of a mobble that they said, we have to stop this? 
is because they were not where they're supposed to be. They didn't want to be kicked out, which of course eventually they are kicked out. They said, let's keep here the domination of a, of a world which promotes our message, our message, our theology, our approach, which is rebellion against the ship. So they are the key instigators of the whole Tower of Babel. Now, when they get kicked out, because all the nations get dispersed, they go back where? They go to Eretz Yisrael. They go to Eretz Yisrael. They go backwards towards Mitzrayim, but they're not content to stay there. They keep moving eastward, and they dominate Shem once again. Where? In the land of Israel. Shem is the owner of Israel. Mati Tzedek Mel Shalom was Shem himself. He's the capital, he's the, he's the king of Yerushalayim, the capital of the country. But guess what? Who's really calling the shots? The five kings of Sodom. Now, we don't have time to go into that, but they are, the, the, the Sodomites were <laughs> incredibly, incredibly rebellious against Hashem, as is going to be noted in upcoming Parshas. So the Canaanim, okay, uh, and the the nations of the Canaanim and the the kings of Sodom, Bechule, and his partners, represented rebellion against Hashem. Now, what were they doing? They were much more radical, even than Chedor Laomer, than Nimrod and Chedor Laomer. Who was Chedor Laomer? So according to Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, Chedor Laomer, the four kings against the five kings, was none other than Hammurabi. Hammurabi created a secular code of law to rival even the code Lahavdal, Lahavdal, of Jewish civil law. The Hammurabi code teams up with Nimrod. Now the big socialist, the big unifier. And they're going to impose a rational, just rule of law upon those wicked people in Canaan. And they attack them. And it's a self-righteous war. They're saying these people are bad, um, but we're good. Look, we've got Nimrod here, we've got Hammurabi here, but it's a total rebellion against Hashem anyway because they don't want to acknowledge Hashem's existence in the world even. It's Nimrod who tries to kill Avrotinu, the lone recognizer of Hashem. So they go and they say, these troublemakers from Canaan were taking away the Semitic lands, which are they associate with that. We got to get those lands back. We have to dominate them. It's good for the world to have a Hammurabi code. It's good for the world to have order. It's good for the world to have structure. It's good for the world to have, you know, equality, whatever they were arguing. And ironically, Avravinu comes to the defense of whom? Of stone. Why would he do that? And why would he be so friendly with the Chittites and, and buy land from them and later in Barsh Chayesara? Here's the point. Avram was sent by Hashem with everything that he would need to go into that den of iniquity known as the families of, of Ham and transform them to good. Because Hashem never gives up on any... Remember, he says he's not going to bring a model against the world. He wants to turn evil into good. And there's only one way to do that. By the tzaddik, by spreading light. That's the light of Avram. And Avram was the seal of king, was a beloved figure to them. He, like the Bab Chev, used to say, don't fight evil, add light. Well, this puts us in the, in the following predicament. The predicament is that good Jews all over the world are intrinsically B'nai Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. And although we had, we were forced to battle evil, intrinsically our job is to add light. Yosef was able to influence the nations by his very goodness and his character. The Jewish people are Rachmanim, Baishanim, Gamli Chasadim. They're not warmongers. They're not Nimrods. And they're certainly not Kenanim. So we have, unfortunately, been cast in that light, which is very hurtful. And yet, this is the nature of the battle against evil that Hashem started way back in Gan Eden. We are forced to do it because God uses us as his messenger to transform evil into good.
even the Nachas himself, even the Satan himself, is an agent of Hashem. So all the events that are swirling around us, and I'll come to a conclusion, don't cut them so black and white. If Trump wins, it's great. Is it the end of all our problems? Far from it. If Kamala wins, maybe you think it's not so great. But at the same time, at the same time, the mission remains the same. If it may not follow this path, it'll follow a different kind of path. And who knows really what's better for the world and Jewish people? We don't really know. And how Hashem's name will be more manifest than the world? We don't really know. And we'll go more to that next week when we see what happens. But point is, Avraham Avinu keeps his clarity. And he says, it doesn't matter who I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with Saddam. I'm dealing with all these people. And even Khadar Lomer. I'll chase them out of here because ultimately they're capturing Lot, who, is the, who was a semi-messenger of Hashem that, that was sent ahead to Saddam to try to influence them. And Avram then has to do it himself and is successful and will continue to be successful. Anun Eshkel and Mamre join him in the battle. And even the son of Nimrod, known as Eliezer of Abram, or Ogmel Habashan, one of the original Rafaim, is the other opinion who Eliezer of Abram was and is the Palit. Either he survived the the uh, the flood, which makes him Ogmel Habashan, or he survived the war of the four or five kings, which means he's the son of Nimrod. Avinu takes the arch enemy's son, Nimrod, his arch enemy's son, and transforms him to the good. That's the Koach of the Tzadik in the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's our ultimate role. But Avram has to take up arms. And so to Klai Yisrael is pushed into a corner and must defend itself. Let's hope and let's dive in that the, that the events of this next epic days, the election and the challenges of an Iranian looming attack and perhaps the entrance into a wider war, Hashem is watching. Hashem has our good intentions in mind. The goal is to reveal his goodness to the world like Avama did. The Jewish people should step up to that role. Whoever wins, it doesn't matter. Whoever attacks, it doesn't matter. Our role is to represent Hashem in the world, to speak to truth and goodness and the defeat of evil. This is the story, this incredible story of these two parshios, and we're living it in real time. And Hashem should give us the koach, clarity and strength to remain upbeat, optimistic, and energized, and agents of Hashem's great name, and not to be distracted by all the forces as they present themselves as the solutions to man's uh, ultimate uh, challenges on earth, there's only one path, and that's going to be the path of Torah. That's what's going to save man from ultimate destruction and bring the Tikkun to the world. Thank you for listening, and let's have uh, a wonderful attitude going into the next couple of days saying, Gamzula Tova, and, not, and on the other hand, if things are, are exciting, you say, it's not the end of the story. A Jew is never um, overjoyed beyond belief or sad beyond belief. On Tisha B'av, we look for Nechama and on Purim and our Chasana, we break a glass. We remember Yushalayim. It is Persia who is called Yaft Elohim Yepes, Yishkan Ba'olei Shem, says Rashi. The there's two perushim. Either means to spread wide, like I said earlier, take over Europe, take over the whole world through exploration, which they did. Or it means beauty. Beauty? What beauty? There's no thing more beautiful than the base on makes itself. Koresh, the Persian monarch, the one who is the model for the Shah of Iran till today, has been usurped by these uh, Islamic fanatics who deny the Torah of Hashem. Koresh acknowledged Hashem. Koresh listened to Hashem and granted and supported and is credited for building, actually building, because his servants did it, the Jews, the Beis HaMikdash. Well, Persia could build one Beis HaMikdash, right? But the next one is going to be built by us. But it doesn't mean we won't have their support. We need Persia to flip back, right, from its unfortunate domination by the Nimrods of the world. Ar Hayom 
and that the Koreshes of the world, whether it's in the form of a U.S. president or an, or, the, or a new leadership in Europe or a new leadership uh, in various countries around the world emerge. The Koresh monarchy is key, and that's why Persia is so part of the modern events. Persia went under evil influence and became Iran. Let's hope it goes out of the Aryan influence and goes back to its original goal, Yaftel Himli Yefes, to support Jewish people building the Bayit Shlishi. Thank you for listening.